I'm more curious your thoughts on how technology has made us or made certain people less empathetic and certain people more empathetic and driven certain ways. I think the way we're using the word empathy in politics now is a little looser than I like to use the word empathy. It's an action concept. It's not, oh, tell me your story. I want to hear it. I'm so open to hearing everybody's pain. I care. I care. I'm not interested in that. That's not going to get us where we need to go. If you're more temperamentally introverted, the fact that you don't go around saying, I care, I care, I care, is probably better. Because that, that kumbaya thing, is it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Empathy is not just putting yourself in somebody's place. It's putting yourself in someone's problem. Ooh, I like that. But instead of their place in their problem, it's more solutions oriented. I am in your problem. Let's think together what helps you in your problem. And can I be make a commitment to you to get into to help you with that problem? Welcome back to Yang Speaks. Today is a special episode. Today we are talking about the future of connection with an incredible guest named Sherry Turkle. Sherry has been writing about the impact on technology and humanity since before it was cool. So it's her first book on what technology is doing to human beings. <laughs> uh, it was written in 1984, before I was born. I don't mean to, to date you, Sherry. You are... Uh, just a pro though. And then I think it's so telling um, when you've been writing about something before computers had even become personalized before the PC existed um, to be writing about how technology can be making us more alone. And she talks about how we can't interact with others and show empathy and understanding to others unless we show empathy and understanding of ourselves and technology is preventing us from doing that. And it's a fascinating conversation on where we go from here as a society, as tech just gets more and more integrated with us as humans. And her newest book is a memoir on understanding empathy for herself. And it's like the culmination of all this like techie humanistic work um, into a more story form. So it's pretty powerful. I learned a ton by speaking with her. Um, she's a remarkable woman. She's brilliant. I'm confident you guys are going to learn a lot too. So join me on this journey on the future of connection right now. I finally started going to the gym again, feeling pretty good about it. And I just went and I used my new pair of Raycon wireless earbuds when I went and they were awesome. It's like they are built for me to move around in, which is cool. There's no wires or stems or things like that to get in your way. They come in a range of different colors. Um, mine's blue, which is awesome. And they're built to perform anywhere at any time. So they're water and sweat resistant, which I liked. And the Bluetooth pairs super quickly with my phone. So whether you're listening to a podcast like this one or binging an audiobook or going through a workout like I'm talking about, Raycom is awesome. Their battery life's up to six hours and Frankly, it's accessible. Like the wireless earbuds are starting at half the price of other premium audio brands, which is cool. So right now, Raycon is offering 15% off all their products for our listeners. And here's what you gotta do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash yang. That's it. You'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. So feel free to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off buy, B-U-Y, Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N.com slash yang. Buyraycon.com slash yang. Check them out. Welcome back to Yank Speaks, everyone. I'm excited. We have a special treat today um, because we're going to talk about something 
Andrew and myself have been very passionate about for a while, and that's our the future of how technology is going to impact our humanity, which is a very vague topic in the abstract. But when you start talking about it, it actually starts getting down to some very core principles. And one of the best experts out there um, that y'all have found and brought to us on this podcast is Sherry Turkle, who is the author of a number of amazing books on this topic and has just written a memoir, which is like her life's journey in actually, frankly, discovering a lot of what we're going to talk about today called The Empathy Diaries. Um, and she's a professor professor at MIT and, and incredibly accomplished. Um, so Sherry, welcome to the future of On Yang Speaks. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here. So there are books written on how technology is affecting our humanity. There's a lot of them. Um, not enough, frankly, in terms of its impact on the mainstream, but there's a lot. But you've been writing about this and researching this since way before it was cool. So tell us a little bit about your background, but I'm really curious on why you were passionate about this when no one else was. When everybody like in a certain time was like, tech is gonna be awesome. They're talking about the positive. You're like, hey, this is destroying us in some ways. Like, tell, So tell us about how you got into this. Well, I fell into it. And when I fell into it, I realized I'd hit gold. I turned, I fell into it because I was given a one year um, kind of uh, postdoctoral internship at MIT. Uh, I was living in Cambridge and MIT was interested. I had been studying psychoanalysis. I'm trained as a clinical psychologist and a, a sociologist, and I was about to begin psychoanalytic training. And um, I'd written a book on the history of psychoanalysis, and MIT. Uh, offered me a position where really I was I was supposed to look at artificial intelligence and cognitive science and, you know, think about how they were going to be hitting the culture much as, you know, 50 to 100 years before psychoanalysis had done the same thing, you know, gotten into people's heads, gotten into the popular culture. But when I came to MIT, I was kind of sitting in my office, eavesdropping on conversations in the hallways. I heard people talking about computers as mind machines that were changing the way they thought about themselves. Don't interrupt me. I need to clear my buffer. I need to reprogram myself. I need to get back to source code on my life. I mean, it was amazing the way people were using the computer really to rethink the self. And um, I thought... I'm not going to study the history of psychoanalysis anymore, fascinating though that was. I'm going to study this. I'm going to study how computers are changing the way that we think. And I went to the dean, I, you know, because already I knew that MIT would be a perfect place to study this. Surrounded by experts and research and all the things you need. Yeah. Hackers and AI people. And I said, you know, I, I want to stay. I want to be a professor here. Um, and this is what I want to study. And they said, well... You, the, that's a really dumb idea because the computer is just a tool. Oh no, they told you like, oh, like that's a classic. My dad's an engineer and he's like, what are you solving for? Um. <laughs> like that is, you know, like that is such a loser, you know, what a loser idea. And then yeah. I said, well, look at my, you know, I'm an empiricist. I'm not a, you know, you were talking about people who study and have ideas and pundits about humanity. I am the opposite. I am a empiricist. I interview people. I go to schools. I sit in classrooms. I go to workplaces. I go to factories. I go to businesses. I, I'm listening. I'm taping. I'm talking. I said, well, listen to my tapes. Listen to this kid saying, when you program a computer, a little piece of your mind goes into the computer's mind. It comes into your mind and you see yourself differently. Hmm. That's not the computer as a tool. That's the computer as a way to think about yourself. Yep. The computer is a tool. You're wasting your time. So I was like, okay, guys, I'm taking my chances. Um, I believe that I have found something. You're making me no promises. I, you're hiring me because you think I'm smart and you think I have good intellectual taste, but... I'm doing this. 
And six years later, I had a book, The Second Self, The Computers and the Human Spirit, which came out in 1984, which really told this story. It was the first book that told this story. And this is really before the PC is extremely popular, right? Like, it, like the, the computer is still the size of a room or whatever it is. Um, and you're seeing this then. You're seeing people cranking on the computer and it's affecting their self then in the eight, early 80s. Yes, there was the Apple II, there was the TRS-80, which you could buy at Radio Shack. There was, I mean, I was seeing the beginnings mm -hmm. of the personal computer movement. No internet, you know, no. And uh, so I published this book and it gets reviewed on the front page of the New York Times. And I'm one of Esquire magazines, you know, 40 people who were changing the nation who were under 40. And I get fired. They fire you? Yeah, they fired me. They came up with some rule, but I, I tell this story in my memoir. For whatever, you know, I let's say it was a combination of many factors, but they fired me. So I went to the, I went to the provost and I said, look, I've written two books. I'm super, super good books. I'm opening up a new field of study, which is, which is going to be your field of study. I'm going to go to the press and say, what, do you, what does a woman have to do to get a job at MIT? And I had tenure wow. the next day. Wow. Good for you. Good for me. But it was also, they really didn't, I mean, they, they assessed their best interests because they finally looked at what I was doing. And I think they said, we don't like this. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to them. In, the book, in, in this memoir, I'm very sympathetic to them because I basically say, you know, who wants an in-house critic? It's not so comfortable having somebody who is telling a very different version of the story. Right. So I've been a, a kind of, I don't want to say an in-house critic, but I've been an in-house alternative voice at MIT really now for decades. And um, I think I've brought a lot to the conversation. You've brought so much to the conversation. Let me ask you this. Has it been frustrating to you, given how popular tech got and how intertwined it now is with our lives and sense of self, that this is something we don't talk about enough or we talk about in like a little like, oh, that's amazing. And then we go back to doing exactly what we were doing. Has it shocked you that it hasn't become as mainstream um, as, as you and I probably think it should be? No, it hasn't shocked me in the same way that, that uh, what we know about sexism, what we know about racism, what we know about uh, uh, white supremacy. Is there anyone who really didn't know about it? And yet to really confront it challenges so much about everything the way this country lives and works and functions so if you say, well, uh, did you know about white supremacy? People, you know, unless people have been really, you know, people say, well, yeah, I, I knew. I, I read those books. I mean, I, yeah, I, I knew. Well, so how surprised are you by this summer? Really surprised. This was a turning point. You know, well, what made it a turning point is that people were finally willing to say, yeah, this is messed up. It goes yeah. from a turning point to a tipping point to where you are, you cannot not speak. And I think that that's really been the story of my work. In other words, I've pointed out, you know, for, for 15, 20 years, I've been talking about what I call it the golden tri triangle of democracy, privacy, and intimacy. That if Facebook messes with your privacy, they're messing with your intimacy, they're messing with your democracy. You can't turn away from that. And yet, I've been interviewing people for 20 years who say, no, 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 no. It'll be fine. They're making money. People love Facebook, whatever excuse, X, Y, Z. We're changing the world. Or, 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 they'll, or more likely, more likely, the generation that really should take it on, the younger people who should take it on as a cause, say things that are so poignant and I, I was going to say so inane, but really they're not inane. They're poignant. They say things like, I like getting ads for the stuff I like. Mm. In other words, they, they look at it and they say, I like, I, I like all this stuff being free. And I like getting ads for the things that I want. Is it really so bad? In my writing, I quote a, a young woman, I think she was 14, who said, 
who would care about me and my little life? When, mm. when confronted with the fact that her data was being scraped. And now we know everybody cares about you and your little life because it's going to be bought and sold and put in a package together with a whole bunch of people just like you and uh, sold to Estee Lauder or whoever the heck wants to buy it. Or to bad actors who are going to, yeah. who are going to try to try to really change your voting habits. When you're dealing with something that has um, such profound, such profound implications politically, as what I've been studying, that where change would be so dramatic, you can't really be surprised if people don't want to look and don't want to act. You have to just keep at it. And I'm hoping and I'm optimistic now that the times will catch up with you. So, have you ever browsed in incognito mode? I used to use it when I was buying flights, trying to make sure they weren't jacking up the price as I kept looking at something. But it is not as incognito as you think. Incognito does not mean invisible. And a lot of these browsers have a form of like private C mode, and they don't really work that well. So how do you actually make yourself invisible? Express VPN. So it turns out that even in incognito mode, your online activity still gets tracked and data brokers can still buy and sell your data. Data harvesters use your IP to uniquely identify you and your location, but with ExpressVPN, your connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server and your IP address is masked. So every time you connect ExpressVPN, you get a random IP address. It's custom to you. It's only shared within the ExpressVPN customer network. It makes it harder for third parties to identify and harvest your data. And best of all, it's super easy to use. Even I can use it and I'm kind of tech illiterate at times. So here's the deal. If you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash yang and get three extra months for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Yang, ExpressVPN dot com slash Yang. There's a TED Talk you gave, um, stood the test of time, which a lot of TED Talks don't, which I loved about yours. Um, but I, I thought it'd be fun to just pull some quotes from that and from other things you said that have just hit home with me. The technology that brings us together is actually driving us apart, um, which is now more of a mainstream thought. I think more people, not mainstream, more people are getting that. Um, and then you said, you ratted off some stats in um, a number of places where you thought, I think it was 89% of Americans admit that they took their phone out in their last social encounter. That number's probably gone up. And then 82% say they felt the conversation was deteriorated after they did so, I want to hear your perspective. How Facebook's supposed to connect all of us, Twitter's supposed to connect all of us, text messaging's supposed to connect, iPhone's supposed to connect all of us. It is ripping us apart. Uh, dive into that. What do you mean by that? How do you see that? I'm not a Luddite at all. I mean, you know, I'm... People accuse us of that too, and we're not. I have really a lot of technology and I love it. I mean, my God, I'm just... You were one of the easiest tech setups we've had as a podcast guest for what it's worth. You knew exactly what you're doing. Show me a new way to use my technology and I'm a happy woman. It's a mischaracterization of me to think of me as a lie. <laughs> but, yeah. but, and I, in my first book, actually, my, my one of my first books was called Life on the Screen, was very um, optimistic about how people could use the fact that you could play avatars online to work through issues of identity that you perhaps hadn't had a chance to work through in your regular life. Because um, I had studied with a great psychologist and psychoanalyst named Eric Erickson, who makes the point that adolescents the wonderful thing about adolescents is they're given a psychosocial moratorium, like a timeout when they can experiment with uh, identity. And in, in, my, in, my, in my memoir, I describe an adolescence in which I was not given a timeout. I was asked to be perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. That was, that, those were the rules. And the idea that you could go online and experience with a little bit of you know, gender roles and, uh, you know, uh, 
be more introverted, be more extroverted, Mm. be more sexually adventurous. I found that fascinating. What bothered me and what I identified to answer the first part of your question where I see the danger is that if you have your phone out, you are not giving the person you're with full attention, which means that you are not enabling an empathic response because empathy requires that you know who you are and that you are coming to someone else ready to give them your full attention. And that is what concerned me. So when you were kind of going to your computer, doing something on your computer of an identity sort and closing your computer down and walking away from your computer and living the rest of your life, that danger thing didn't go off in my mind. But when in the middle of a conversation, I said, excuse me, this, I have to look at my phone And you're feeling, well, hold on, I've just made myself vulnerable to you. What about me? Well, what about me? Then I was concerned. So that was my essential argument about, by by the time I gave that talk in 2012, it was well underway. It's on skis now. And I'm hoping that the pandemic kind of slows us down a little bit. That is the real danger that we undermine our capacity for empathy by undermining our capacity for solitude, first of all, which is where empathy was born. In order to be empathic with someone else, you have to be able to sit with yourself and be know who you are. If every minute you're being diverted by your phone, you never really need to do that. And so you're yeah. not good at it. You, don't, you look to other people to tell you who you are. So it makes you a terrible empathic partner. And so that really is where I was when I wrote that TED Talk. And the reason that it reads like it happened yesterday, there's nothing in the TED Talk that's anachronistic, is that um, we're in that same regime. I don't have a lot of natural empathy. I mean, Jonathan Haidt writes a lot about like certain people are like more inclined to be more empathetic, like the bleeding heart um, type. Um, I care, but uh, like it's and I also um, suffer with um, ADHD. Um, it's not, I don't have it at a severe level, but, um, slightly. And that is so that, so for someone that is not that empathetic, like naturally, who then maybe struggles to pay attention naturally as well, you can come off as even less empathetic. And I think people that don't know me, I think I'm, you know, come off as either more distant. People that do know me know that like if, when it's forced in front of my, my face, the empathy is there, but it's, it's something I've personally struggled with. And I think I'm more curious your thoughts on how, technology has made us or made certain people less empathetic and certain people more empathetic and driven certain ways? That's a great question because it brings the question of empathy into the, into the, the area of politics where, of course, it needs to go. I think the way we're using the word empathy in politics now is a little looser than I like to use the word empathy. Joe Biden is empathic, is the empathy president. We all need to be empathic, kumbaya. I'm using empathy in a more um, rigorous way, a way that demands action and political action. I believe it's kind of the most important political concept. It's a political concept going forward in this way. It's an action concept. It's not, oh, tell me your story. I want to hear it. I'm so open to hearing everybody's pain. I care. I care. I'm not interested in that. That's not going to get us where we need to go. If you're more temperamentally introverted, the fact that you don't go around saying, I care, I care, I care, is probably better. Because that that kumbaya thing, is it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Empathy is not just putting yourself in somebody's place. It's putting yourself in someone's problem. Ooh, I like that. But instead of their place in their problem, it's more solutions oriented. I am in your problem. Let's think together what helps you in your problem. And can I be, make a commitment to you to get into, to help you with that problem. And not only that, um, how can I do that and really stick with it? You know, when my students come to see me and say, I don't want to come to office hours, I, I just want to send you the right question. And you I, send, I want to send you the perfect question and I'm going to, you'll send me back the perfect answer. I say, no, 
you have to come see me or now in COVID times, you have to spend an hour on the telephone with me where mm. I can give you full attention because I need to put myself in your problem because I need to make a commitment to you so that if you want to go to medical school, I'm not just writing, filling out some form letter, but I'm really going to go the distance for you and figure out what, what are your weaknesses so that I can really get in there and fight for you. It's an action empathy. It's not just a, a vague listening empathy. It's a political, it's a, and it's an, it's an empathy with humility. A lot of people's empathy these days start with, tell me, tell me, oh, you were divorced? Oh my God, I was divorced. I know, I know how you feel. It's the humility to say, I don't know how you feel. That's what I say to my students. I don't know your situation, but I'm, I'm smart and I'm a listener and I'm, I, I'm, I'm secure in my skin mm. and I'm going to be there mm. for you. So the left loves, we, I, we tend to take the empathy too far. I say we, because I am a Democrat, I lean left. Um, but I, I think my favorite older example is, um, is abolish ice, which, um, so for example, when in 2000s, I think it was 2017 or late 2016, maybe, where we started realizing we had kids in cages at the border. And the left, rightfully so, is like empathetic, like, oh my gosh, families ripped apart. Can you imagine the struggle? And like, yes, that is horrific. We're the United States of America. We should not be doing this, right? And we immediately went to abolish ice. Like we eventually, like, how do we solve this? It was like, get rid of ice. And the problem with that play is ice does... Um, a lot of things that are not related to border security that are really great, like uh, they are our front lines for fighting child sex trafficking in the United States. And they do a lot of like customs administration stuff that we really want. And so the empathetic side, I think a, a lot of people get put in this bind where you're like, if you say, oh, I don't think you should abolish ICE. Well, you don't have empathy for the, what about the kids in cages, right? Um, so that, the, and to your point, that is not so, the pro you're not getting into tell me about solving your problem of empathy. Like, how do I really understand what our real challenge is here? And we still have the problem at the border today. Um, so I'm not saying that we've, you know, it doesn't matter who's right or wrong. The problem is we've then, we now have a wedge issue. Well, I think so many humanitarian, I mean, I think that part of the tragedy of our country today is that so many humanitarian problems have become political problems. It's as though if I said to you, look, one of the things that concerns me as a um, as someone interested in technology and someone interested in the human condition is that I'm not, cre I really have the amount of writing I have done on why robots shouldn't be psychotherapists. I mean, it sort of fills a book, <laughs> right? It sort, of, it sort of fills a book. Now, I have such good reasons why robots shouldn't be psychotherapists, mostly because um, they don't have human bodies. It's not that they can't simulate being asking all the right questions and won't be smart enough to ask even more right questions. But since they don't have human bodies, they, they are not afraid of death. They're not afraid of losing their children or in the case of COVID saying goodbye to their children on an iPad. Um, so the, some of the concerns I've had in the past year, um, where I was afraid of death, where I thought I might have to say goodbye to my daughter. Why would I talk? To, how would a robot chat? That would be weird to talk to a robot about what I was really worried about because a robot, that just would not be what a robot would naturally have an experience or an emotional experience with. So it just seemed obscene that I should be, that I should be thinking about talking to a robot about these matters. So the point is, if that became a right-left issue, we're still at a point where we'd say, well, that's stupid. Why should you know Mitch McConnell versus Chuck Schumer be taking positions on robots? And that's how I feel about this thing at the border. It has an ad about the children in cages. You know what? Children in cages is a bad thing, but it's a very complicated thing because they're there for a reason. It's not that the children just show up, hi, I want to be in a cage. The, ch I mean, the, children, the children show up because something is happening in South and Central America. 
that, 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 that's a, a humanitarian and ecological political crisis uh, that, that, that continues on no matter who's president and that needs to be addressed. And, and, and yet, it's as though we tur- turned psychotherapy robots for or against into something that Republicans and Democrats had to take a position on. Instead of saying, well, that's a humanitarian question and we should discuss it every, this has nothing to do with politics. This has to do with how we conceive of the human spirit. It's such a good analogy because that's not a political fight yet. I'm sure it will be 10 years from now or whatever it is. All right, let's face it, guys. Taking trips to the post office is probably not how you want to spend your time. And that's why we recommend mailing and shipping online at stamps.com. Stamps.com allows you to mail and ship anytime, anywhere, right from your computer. Send letters, ship packages, and pay a lot less with discounted rates from USPS, UPS, and more. And stamps.com has saved businesses thousands of hours and tons of money. So with stamps.com, you get the services of the post office and UPS all in one place. I love it because I always forget to either buy stamps or don't even think about it. And then I'm like, oh crap, what do I need to do? Go to stamps.com, bang, it's right there. Super simple, easy. You can do it from anywhere you are because we travel a lot and ship stuff extremely conveniently. So here's the deal. Stop wasting time going to the post office and go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with our promo code YANG, you get a special offer that includes a four week trial, plus free postage and a digital scale, no long-term commitments or contracts. So just go to stamps.com, Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Yang. That's stamps.com, promo code Yang, stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. You have said so many powerful things. Um, You're like this sage to me in the sense that you've said things that not only not only were right at the time and groundbreaking at the time, but they were they're more right and more groundbreaking today, ten years later, whenever Evelyn you said them. So here's a couple you said. We ex- I'm just gonna read them off and just let them sit because they're powerful. You said we expect more from technology than we do from each other. You said we're lonely, but afraid of intimacy. You said, we expect, we have the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship and that we need to learn to be alone. And these statements are powerful and they hit you. But I think based on what we're talking about, a lot of like our political divisiveness, now it's fueled by social media and there's other things that are are fueled by politics, fueled by a lot of things. But a lot of it is... uh, at the core, like we're just not talking to each other and technology is setting that barrier. What have you seen in your research in the combination of more people to talk to, but more lonely, you know, Um, and how that's affecting our ability to rationalize, debate, converse, love, that sort of thing. One man I interviewed who only one, who basically wanted to do all of his business and personal life on, on chat, he really likes to avoid face-to-face, but I, I insist on doing all of my interviews face-to-face. So I pointed out to him, well, you know, the conversation we was have, we were having was face-to-face. And he sort of took that in, but he, he stuck to his guns and he came out with this. He says, the scary thing about conversation is that it's in real time and you never know what the other person is going to say. In other words, you're vulnerable in a way that he hated. Whereas if you can hide behind your screen, you can sort of either drop out, say, got to go, or sort of as they're composing, you can kind of compose a little bit of a false self because they don't see your reaction. They don't see if you're upset. There's no tone to your statement. What ties together my the 10, your five favorite quotes of mine is that they're all about being less vulnerable if you can hide behind technology. The illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship is about being less vulnerable because you can hide behind your screen. 
Have you read, um, I'm assuming you have, or at least heard of it, read iGen? Yes. Um, it freaked me out. And Andrew made me read it before I joined the campaign to talk about just what this book talks about. And we actually had the author on the podcast a while back um, talking about how this tech is in, is hitting our kids. And basically her one of her main theses of the book, by, based on the numbers, is that our kids are developing slower um, mentally. So like if you're 11, you're showing the social um basically actions of a nine-year-old and you're basically two to three years behind, um, which has oddly some pro, a lot of cons, but oddly some pros, um, at least for parents in some ways, um, cause they get to like spend more time with their, their, their kids, like their parents more and things like that, which I, I don't know, maybe there's some benefits there. My question is twofold. One, just generically, what do you think, is, how is this affecting our children um, and people born in society today, like, you know, cause it's getting, they're now immersed, right? Where it's babies on iPads. What is this doing to our children? And two, it's a deeper question. Does it not matter in, and I know, I, I think I know where you're going to stand on this, but I'm curious because 50 years from now, uh, like 80 years from now, where everybody a hundred years from now, where anyone who didn't grow up in the internet age is long gone. Is there a world where we don't need human interaction? We're all just like lonely, miserable, but like friendship is actually through text and it's a different way we express emotion. No, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> I knew that was the answer, but I really want your thoughts. I tell a story in my memoir. I go to a movie with Marvin Minsky, who's a great AI pioneer. And he was a good friend. And, and uh, we had a sort of, you know, working relationship. Uh, but he's really the, the greatest AI p person at, at MIT when I get there. And we go to see Tron. We come out to the, of the movie, and all the students are standing around, and he was the kind of guy who liked to like give speeches you know, about what he thought. And he said, what this movie shows is that children should see this movie, and they should never see Bambi. Is that about Tron? Yeah. And I bit, I, you know, I went for the bait. I was so stupid. I went for the bait. Mm. I said, every kid loves Bambi. Why can't kids love Bambi? See Bambi. I want my daughter to see Bambi. Why can't kids see Bambi? And he said, because much as you've said now, we're moving towards a society where our children will be raised by robots and we're all going to have implants and we're not going to need this, this kind of uh, nurturant attachment mothering. Children shouldn't learn that mothers are special. Children shouldn't learn that death is special. We're not going to die. Wow. We're going to be part robot and part this. All the things that Bambi teaches are just sentimental pap, and it's very bad for children to see it. And I remember thinking as I bought, you know, extra copies of Bambi for my daughter so we would have them like every place we went in case they pulled Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember thinking, you know, um, some of these technologists and there's this idea that technology is going to be in our relationships and technology, every, everyone will forget the importance of just having a conversation and everybody will forget the importance of having a mother instead of a more competent robot to take care of you. I think this is not going to happen. I think that, you know, there's, that, that people are going to re remember and care about the, 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 the good old fashioned values of human attachment, because they are what makes us human. And I think that, that that is for me, the lesson of the pandemic, is that we have lived as we've been on our screens as much as we wanted. We've had the best of tech, you get your food delivered, you get your you want to zoom to London, zoom to Tunisia, you know, zoom away. But basically, we have craved the embrace, the full embrace of the human. And I think we've come to crave it and, and revalue it and, and, and realize that th there's something in our physiology that makes us better when we have it. And I, I think that um, the parents who I interview about, you know, going back to school with their kids who before um, before the pandemic said, give me a supercomputer that will personalize learning for my child and give me the best mm -hmm. teachers from all over the world. Now they say, give me a person. Do you have a person to apply to this child? 
This child needs a relationship. This child needs love. This child needs conversation. This child needs uh, 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 mentors and people who love hugs and mentors. So I, I think this is a learning opportunity for us to revalue what technology can give us and to say, but it isn't everything and we really need people. This is the great hope from the pandemic, in my opinion, is that we learned the extent of how good our tech is right now and frankly, where it can get better. It has accelerated all, almost every trend that Andrew Yang and, and, and our team ran for president on. Automation of jobs, mental health, deterioration, uh, income inequality. I mean, you go down the list. However, the one silver lining, and it's my hope, is like, and, and you kind of had this in after the Spanish flu in the Roaring Twenties, where people are just so desperate for humans that we swing the pendulum back the other way. That is my hope. All right, if you're like me, when you have a bad night's sleep, you remember it. Like I can remember three or four, maybe my top 10 even like worst night's sleep because it just kills you. And like either up all night or you wake up with a massive backache. And I'm proud to say that I'm a massive supporter of Helix Sleep because they give me great night's sleep. I have the King Lux mattress. It's massive, it's comfortable, it is perfect. Oh. I'm a huge, huge Helix fan. So you go online, you take a two minute quiz, you match a mattress with your body type. With your hot sleeper, you're like a firm mattress, like soft mattress, doesn't matter. You figure out what your custom preferences are. You get matched with the mattress, they ship it to you in a box, it pops out beautifully, no hassle, super easy. It was an overall mattress, top pick in 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. So here's the deal, go to helixsleep.com slash yang and take their two minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a custom mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life for real. Helix is offering right now up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash yang. So that's helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash yang for up to $200 off and two free pillows. Did you see, this video came out yesterday when we recorded it. So we're recording this on April 9th. So this came out April 8th. Uh, Elon Musk's uh, company, Neuralink, had posted a video of a monkey tied to his Neuralink sensor uh, playing Pong with his mind. Uh, there's a million beautiful applications of this and probably more beautiful than, than harmful for sure. Um, but my, and I don't know, no one knows the timeline of this. Elon says he's going to start doing on humans in a year. And so, uh, you know, it's probably five to 10 before it's like we work out the kinks, but then it'll accelerate. Um, and maybe that's a good way to start talking about solutions. In talking about solutions, I don't think we've defined the problem. We need to define what we, as a country, both individually and for our families, then for our communities, then for the issues we care most about. Is it Me Too? Is it, is it white supremacism? I mean, there, there are a host of issues. For those problems, what technology, what can we look for in technology that will be genuinely helpful? And then we can say, well, given that problem, can technology help me? But it isn't as though there's kind of like a universe of everything and you say, Elon, bring it, bring the monkey and his, you know, if I were paraplegic and I wanted to be thinking about how I could have a more natural way of activating dead uh, neurons in my ha fingers, you know, to kind of reactivate n dead neurons, I mean, I would be celebrating. In other words, th there are so many of applications course. of that. But but to say, let's just think about that, and d does that help us, or does technology help us? Technology, technology is not a uh, is not a solution looking for a problem. It's much better when you don't give technology the agency, and you say you can do some things. Can you that, with that technology? Can you help me with this? 
And that's why I think that we have to be much more, the wonderful thing for me about people with sophistication in technology coming and going into politics is that people who understand technology can now say, okay, technology, I understand you. Not like that terrible you know, um, scene in Congress where people were interviewing Mark Zuckerberg right. and asking him about pipes. And he, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was obscene. Comical. Comical. People who know about technology can now turn to technology and say, you know, I have some, I have some problems for pe- that real people are suffering with. Help me here. Help me here. Um, that is where the future should lie. Not in, not in saying where will technology take us? It's time to stop mm. that kind of thinking. It's, Technology. I have some places that I have some places that um, income inequality need to go. Can you help? I have some places that um, uh, better police training need to go. Can you help? I have some place. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any policy solutions, either at a local or federal level, that excite you right now that would start solving a lot of the issues you have pointed out for decades? Yeah, well, well a very, some one very basic one. I, I I signed a petition yesterday. I think is that no, I mean, just to show you how low level this can be, but how crucial. Uh, Facebook wants Instagram for children under twelve. No, that is not a good idea. I mean, just to show you how granular you can get when you actually start thinking about this. Like, where could technology hurt me tomorrow? That's a good exercise for everybody to do. Instead of thinking, oh, my God, let me think of some tech policy. Where could technology hurt me tomorrow and hurt the things I care about most tomorrow? I bet there's somebody in the tech industry planning that very thing. To get people invested in policy, you have to stop thinking, oh, policy is like for people in Washington. I'm like, no, policy is things that are about you and your family. Think of the thing that really could screw you up tomorrow. What would your recommendation be to families whether it's parents or just individuals like myself, like, hey, tech is like, I have like problems paying attention. Tech makes that 10 times worse. It, it, it hurts me. Um, what would you recommend that people can do now in their daily lives, right? To make their own reality better. I have a simple list. The car, dinner, the car, dinner, food. Car, dinner, food, no tech. And when you're in the car with children or with your friends, you say to them, conversation is so precious. Talk to me. Mm. When you're in the car with your children, if you have children, and they, they, that's when they really want you to do social media, you say, you know, we have so little time to talk. I shouldn't be texting in the car. This is a time I really want to talk to you. I'm your parent hate me later. Food preparation. When we're preparing food in my home, we don't use the phone. And then bedroom. I mean, the number of couples who are, who are texting while they're in bed, getting ready to be in bed, making love. Have a notion of sacred space. It's not a religious notion. It's a make up your own idea of sacred. Places in the house where they can go where their phones don't. And you could go there once a day. You go there once every two days. I'm not telling you how much you should go there. But it's some place where you don't bring your phone. And then it gives you an opportunity to see what can I think about when my phone isn't there. It gives you an opportunity to ask yourself that question. I wonder what ideas come to me when my phone isn't around. But I don't make any rules about how much television you should watch. I love television. And when I watch television with my family, we talk, we talk to the television, we make comments. That's true. Yeah. It can be really connecting. Yeah. So my girlfriend, um, she loves when we have car time. Um, now living in New York City, we don't have a car, but in the pandemic, we, we would take rent a car and take road trips. Um, and... She loved it because for me, with a like slight ADD, I have something to focus on. I can focus on, and then I can still have a it, walking's good too. But the car, um, and you know, she's got five hours. I can't go anywhere. We have to have a deep conversation, um, and I enjoy it because I get to know her better, and I get some. You know, you get to know yourself better when you have a good conversation. Um, so I love that. And one of the things I love about your field and your work is, and it's been my problem with academics. And look, we need academics in general. This research and this stuff is so 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 important, but 
there's such brilliant research out there that doesn't get connected to practice. Um, and by definition, your work has to be put into practice because it's literally, you're like studying the practice. You're studying the human like execution and interaction with technology. Um, so I love that. Thank you, uh, car dinner food or car food bedroom, however you want to slice that. I'm so curious at this trajectory you've been on because you've been writing about tech and humanity and researching tech and humanity and teaching technology and humanity for you know for years and you then recently and I'm assuming this was a covid project it maybe started before but you became you wrote a memoir it's called the empathy diaries but you you wrote a completely different book um about your own personal journey why the shift why did you go that way um to to kind of further your your efforts and vision here? The book bega began when after I wrote my first book on computers and people, which was called The Second Self, was 1984. And I was holding on to a family secret that my the person who I said was my father was not my father. My mother didn't want anyone to know that she had been divorced and that I had a secret father. And she would never talk to me about why she just said, we're never going to talk about him and you're going to wow. talk, have a different name. And like, I, I first, I mean, I used to go to one school and I had to write my real name because it was my legal name. And then I would travel to a different neighborhood and hide my books. I was the secret agent. <laughs> I was a little Jewish Brooklyn secret agent. Wow. And um, my interest in empathy began by trying to figure out why would my mother do this? The Nancy Drew of my own life. <laughs> my, I publish this book. I get onto the cover of Esquire magazine. They come to write an article about me. And this very nice interviewer asks me, so I just read The Second Self. It's like super brilliant. You're super brilliant. You thank your mom who's died, you know, a million times, da, 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 da. But you don't say anything about your father. So who's your dad? What did he do? You know, and I behave. I'm like, oh, I do like a diva. Like, oh, no. I can't discuss that. I can only discuss my work. I, I, I never discuss my personal life. No, no. I, you know, mm. I behave like a super crazy person, like a super crazy person. And he walked out. And of course, in Esquire magazine, he writes about that I'm a little crazy, which was like very painful. He says something like, well, you know, her brand is the, uh, is the thought and feeling are integrated. But if you ask her a question that asks about thought and feeling, she freaks out. It's so painful to see that stuff in writing too, even though it doesn't fully matter. It's, it matters at the time. Right? I just was like, he's right. He's right. I've been holding this family secret for, for four decades. What is this? You know, what, or three decades, what is this? So I, um, I, I literally, I saw him walk out the door. I knew what was going to happen. I called up my half sister and brother. I told him the truth. I called up Milton Turkle, and who was this stepfather who I'd been lying about. I said, I'm, it's over. You know, nothing, I haven't done anything wrong. There's nothing so horrible in my life that I need to hide it. I said, I am just free. And then I had to figure out how this very particular um, background it was clear to me that this very particular background of trying to figure out all of these people's motivations had sort of set me up in some way and had, I had turned lemon into lemonade. It had turned me into the kinds of, into the kind of person who could do the work I was doing. And I wanted to write that book. So I've been writing that, this book since really 1984. You've said this a number of ways. In order to have empathy for others, you have to have empathy for yourself and understand it. Did you, once you started having empathy for yourself, did your research and the academic and the, the hard aspects of the technology and how we function as humans, did that all just crystallize? Did it, was, it, was it easier? Did you see your research from a different lens there to make you better at what you do? Like, how did that impact it? It really did. Because I was able to um, just function at a higher level. I became more, um, everything about me, 
Uh, and of course, that had, there were other things going on in my life. I was in a psychoanalyst, had life experiences, I became older. I mean, so many things happened. It, it wasn't a controlled experiment. But I think that really the close examination of your life and coming to terms with the forces that have gotten you to do the passionate work that you do make you better at your work. Uh, because I was able to approach my work with distance. I was able to, uh, um, and a kind of lightness. I could see my stake in it. I could be more distant from it. I was more compassionate with my, in other words, and you know, when it's like, uh, as I tell my students, you know, uh, in work, you have ups and downs. Some experiments don't work. Some books don't work. Some papers don't get published. Some, you know, make sure you love the journey. And this book, you know, and, and my work, the better I understood my work and the better I understood the importance of my work, uh, because there's been many years in which I've been pitching this story about computers changing the way we think. And people have just said to me, that is the most stupid thing. You know, computer's a tool. Why are you doing this? This is like, what a this is really not the thing. And I just have to love the work, you know, and I have to know how it connects to my life. And I have to know how it's really a, an expression of my, it's, it is my, it's my, it's my, it's the true expression of my talents. One of the things Andrew and I have been focused on a lot and like in me personally, is like my theory of change for the next 10 maybe 50, 100 years of like, I think authenticity overall is good, it's going to matter. And your book, I think, points out that in order to be authentic, you need to really understand yourself. You need to know what that self is, to be confident in your own skin. Um, and it puts the research in a completely different light, a completely more powerful light, um, because when people read it, um, I think after reading this book and then looking back at the work that you've done for decades, it's we know what you stand for, you know where it's coming from, you know the compassion, the empathy that you've had and you're sharing with others. Thank you for writing this. Your book, Empathy Diaries, guys, um, we'll put a link to um, where you can get it as well. But Sherry, it's been it's been a, such a, it's an honor just because how impressive you are, but it's been a privilege just and, and a joy to, to chat with you. So thank you for your time and for teaching me some things. I feel the same way, it's been really nice. Thank you, Sherry. Talk soon, everybody. Cool.